Well, there you go. That's LeBron James's new commercial with Nike. Now, Carl, talk to me about this commercial. Do you think that this was something that he needed to do for what many people thought was his ruined legacy and ruined reputation, or do you think that this is just another great marketing ploy by Nike? Well, Nike has very great advertisements. Like, this one was a little ADD. I don't know. It just seemed different from their typical ads. But, and I loved how they took a shot at Charles when he, he's actually a right. Nike person, and they, like, uh, that was great. But, um, the, the thing I, I understand about LeBron, I've always respected what he did, you know, like, Money did go to charities, and it was ES ESPN really wanted that to happen anyway. We knew something huge was going to happen. The, the summer of 2010 was being built up by NBA GMs for four years. People planned around this. Right. And LeBron got a very unique chance to play with Bosch and Wade. And I think he just decided, like, this whole thing was going to be in effect, but the whole thing about, you know, wanting to play with them, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If, if I were to play with him, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't pass that up. If, but, but if it were to come to some other team, like LeBron would always be thinking, what if I had joined the Heat? Right. He well, now, do Aaron, that. do you think that LeBron is thinking that this, this commercial that he just put out is kind of giving everyone a look at why he made his decision the way he did? Um, maybe. I think it has more to do with the, um, he, the public's gotten to him. I think it's between the public's gotten to him and Nike really is genius about writing a campaign when it's live and ready to go. And, and that's what they're doing, man. They're, that's what the hot subject is. So why not, you know, put your slap your name on top of it? There you go. Now I want to switch, uh, switch gears just a little bit and talk about some other teams in the NBA. Carl, who did you see in these first two or I guess three nights of games that really impressed you other than, you know, the Miami Heat? Well, the Spurs, I actually went to the Spurs game in San Antonio opening night and I was really impressed. I mean, they were playing the Pacers, so it's not exactly a judgment game, but they had three, their big three were all in 20s. Manu played like an all-star. Tony is definitely back, and Tim Duncan is still an incredible player. He's an ageless wonder. Oh, it's, I don't understand how he's that good. It's crazy. Arn, what about you? Um, I did like, I did see Houston. I thought Houston looked good. As long as Yao Ming can stay healthy, I'd be really interested to see what they can actually do in the season. Um, I like the Clippers too. I thought the Clippers looked good. Uh, seeing them work together looked good. Um, and uh, who out there in the East? I saw um, Orlando. Um, if you know if Howard can start making getting some post moves and really working the post, um, you could see a nice little threat over there. Yeah, uh, he really does run Florida. But now you know there's new new players oh, yeah. in town that can run Florida for him. But I want to I want to go to a little off topic subject. Kevin Durant. He dropped another 30-plus point game. Uh, he, he led the league in scoring last year with over, what was it, I think 31.8 points per game. Mm -hmm. He's just been on fire. He led Team USA to a FIBA World Basketball Championship. Carl, do you think that with everything that's going on with LeBron's issues with his image right now and with how Dwayne Wade's getting older, Melo's getting older, Kobe is about to be in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. Do you think that Kevin Durant is going to be the guy who can step up and really become the face of the NBA? Well, I, I think he's better than Kobe Bryant at this point, and that's incredible for a 22-year-old kid to be right. the leader in scoring in the NBA last year. The thing that hurts him is Oklahoma City is not a major market. If Kevin Durant were in New York City, somewhere big like that, he'd be the best player in the world. Right. You know, right. like he'd be getting all this you know, media attention. But Oklahoma City is a quiet place, and Kevin Durant doesn't get the publicity he deserves. And well, part of it is, I mean, Kevin Durant's a quiet kid. You know, he's, he's never been one to really mouth off or, sh you know, show up his teammates. In fact, when he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated recently, he said he wouldn't do it unless he could have two of his unknown teammates on the cover with him. So it's not just him getting the publicity, it's he, he wanting his team to get the publicity as well. Do you think that... Uh, Aaron, do you think that he's going to really step up and become that premier player? Uh, well, unfortunately, I think uh, his success as the face of the NBA is going to really uh, depend on how these other stars, if they fail or succeed, what they're doing right now. So uh, because of what the drama is going on right now, there's not much sun on him, you know, not to mention, as Carl said, you know, it's a, it's a small league team. But as long as he can stay consistent and keep them winning, when the light is not sh shining on Miami, which it won't be later in the season, uh, basically he'll he'll shine again and he'll continue and they'll look at that and, and we'll see, see where he can go. Very interesting comments, guys. And that's all the time we're going to have for today for our basketball segment. So let's go ahead and get into the last word. In a college football season that was tattooed with upsets and underdogs, 
the one thing that seems to remain consistent is inconsistency. Three weeks in a row, we saw the number one team go on the road to face a ranked conference opponent, and all three weeks, our number one team went home with their tail between their legs. So what does this mean for college football? It means that we might finally see a non-automatic BCS qualifier in the BCS championship game. This year, we've seen favorites fall like leaves in autumn, and some of those games have been quite ugly. But I think that seasons like this every once in a while are good, and it's good to have parity for the game. It really brings us all back down to earth. And speaking of coming back down to earth, Oklahoma State wide receiver Justin Blackman has been soaring high this season. He leads the nation in receiving yards per game, yards on the season, and in touchdown catches. But, unfortunately for him, the stupidity bug bit Blackman in the leg. As he and three teammates were driving back to Stillwater after attending a Dallas Cowboys game, he was pulled over for going 92 in a 60. Not only was he speeding, but the 20-year-old sophomore had also been drinking. So after spending a night in jail and receiving a DUI, Oklahoma State head coach Mike Gundy has decided to suspend Blackman for this week's game against K-State. The kid has the world in front of him. He's 6'1", 210, and runs a 4'4", He's definitely going to be a high draft pick in two years. But he's going to be lucky if he lives that long if he's making dumb decisions like that. Why would a kid with such talent want to risk it all for just a couple of $10 beers at an NFL game? It's just stupid. Well, hopefully Coach Gundy can make sure he knows that it's not worth it. Now moving on to baseball for a moment, something that has really bothered me happened this week. Cliff Lee was 7-0 in his playoff career, shutting down multiple Yankee teams multiple times, and a few other great teams as well. But of all teams, he decides to give up seven runs to the Giants. The who? The Giants haven't been relevant since Mr. Steroid Bonds hit 73 home runs back in 2001. Even though they went to the World Series the next year, no one cared. I guess I'm just a little disappointed. You know, but call me Miss Cleo, but I see Cliff Lee having two more games to pitch in this series, and I honestly see him dominating both games. At least I hope I do. And I would also, unfortunately, like to end talking about some tragic news. As most of us know, two weeks ago, Rutgers defensive tackle Eric Legrand was paralyzed after making a tackle on a kickoff play against Army. It's an absolute shame to hear and see those things happen. But as always, it's wonderful when you see a community back at Citizens. The New Jersey Nets are going to donate $75,000 to help pay for the surgery that his family can't afford. And the Army Scarlet or Black Knights are going to have the number 52 decal on their helmets for the rest of the season. It's just one of those freak accidents that you hate to see happen. And speaking of a freak accident, another freak accident happened earlier this week. During a Notre Dame practice on Tuesday, there were gusts of winds up to 60 miles an hour. Why Coach Brian Kelly didn't call off the practice, I don't know. But unfortunately, one of those gusts knocked over the scissor tower that 20-year-old Declan Sullivan was standing on in order to film the practice for the Irish. Unfortunately, he died later that day at the hospital. The Golden Domers will also wear a decal on their helmet to represent their lost colleague. So thoughts and prayers go out to both the Sullivan and the Legrand families. Well, I hope you enjoyed our show this week and be on the lookout for a special fantasy football segment next week. We'll hope you'll come back and see us. And for everyone on Texas Nation, I'm Grant Levinson. We'll see you next time. Good show. Good show.